Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, houseplants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188. Welcome to Gardening with Burke Nursery, the show where we help you grow your garden and increase the curb appeal of your yard. I'm your host, Miss Dikacheris, the horticulturalist at Burke Nursery and Garden Center. One area of gardening that always excites me is the vegetable and herb gardens that surround my house. In some areas of my yard, I have an actual cultivated vegetable garden where in other areas of the yard, such as my deck, I have a potted herb garden that lets me get those fresh culinary herbs when I'm cooking one of my favorite meals. I'm glad that you can join me today as I share with you some great techniques for creating your edible garden and the journey I took for success in my yard. We're actually very lucky living here in Northern Virginia because we're in an area where our climate lets us grow some cool season plants or trees or even shrubs, or even some warm season plants, trees or shrubs. So the area that we're located in is zone 7A. The other thing that we're lucky is that we actually have two different geological areas here in our area. So, Fairfax County is in what is known as the Coastal Plains area, and that sometimes means that we get some of the warmer breezes coming in. And then Loudoun County is in the Piedmont area, and so the Piedmont area sometimes gets some of the cooler breezes. So you'll be surprised, maybe, or maybe not, that what may grow in your yard may not grow in somebody else's yard. But recently, I actually taught this seminar at Burke Nursery and Garden Center, and I had quite a few interesting questions from the participants of that seminar. And one of the questions was, why is it important to know the zone when planting vegetables? Well, knowing the zone when planting vegetables is important because then we understand when it might freeze, when it might not freeze, and also, we can rely on Virginia Tech and some of the wonderful publications that you find at the Virginia Tech website to get actual planting dates, planting dates for your seeds and planting dates for the actual plants, which I'll be calling transplants throughout this program. If you're interested in receiving this document, then you can go to the Virginia Tech website which is pubs.ext.vt.edu, and just type in planting dates in their particular search engine. And what you'll find is this document that comes up, and the document is called Virginia's Home Garden Planting Guide, Recommended Planting Dates and Amounts to Plant. Now, I actually have a picture of the most important page in this document, and that most important page is page four, and what you'll see is recommended planting and harvest dates, hardiness zone 7A. That's us. That's us here in Northern Virginia. The one thing that is slightly different, and Virginia Tech puts a disclaimer on this form, is that they put down that the last spring frost is between April 15th and April 25th. In actuality, we can sometimes get a frost as late as Mother's Day, which is mid-May. And for that reason, you need to be very careful with the herbs that you want to plant outside. And one of the herbs I don't recommend planting before mid-May is actually your basil herb, just in case there's a late frost, unless you plant it in pots and then bring in the pots before the late frost happens. 
So if you look at this form, what you will see is that some of the forms have asterisks after them, and some of the vegetables, and some don't. If you see the asterisk after a vegetable, then what that means is that that vegetable needs to be a transplant. The other vegetables, if there's no asterisk, what that means is based on the planting date that you see in this guide, you're actually able to put the seeds directly into the garden. And so this is why this really helps you. Well, what I'd like to show you now, here is a picture of my cultivated garden. I don't have a lot of sun space in my yard. This is about the only sun space I have. The rest of my yard has a lot of trees and creates a lot of shade. To have a good garden, you need to have at least six hours of afternoon sun. And I'm talking about a vegetable garden. Much preferred is eight to 10 hours, but six hours will do. Now in my case, I have a deer problem. So what I had was a friend of mine was bored one day, serious, he really was bored one day. He didn't know what to do with himself. And this dear friend actually is a business owner who works these hours, but he finds gardening and doing things in the yard relaxing. So when I was complaining about the deer problem, I come home one day and there he is building a fence around my garden so that it can prevent deers from coming in. Next, I found I have a bird problem. Sometimes we tend to blame the squirrels or the chipmunks or other things that are eating our, our especially the little small um, tomato plants, when it's actually birds flying in. So he created a cover for the birds. And now my little garden has a roof. The birds can't get in, the deer can't get in. Meanwhile, we have clay soil here in Northern Virginia. And in my garden, I tend to have a drainage problem. Because my house is technically built into a hill, what happens is that when it rains, all that rain comes down the hill and it can go into my garden. So with these two considerations in mind, I knew that I needed to amend the soil. And the first thing that I did was that I went to my all-time favorite compost, which is mushroom compost. I like mushroom compost because it has the right pH for a vegetable garden. Your vegetable gardens tend to like to have pH around 6 to 7 pH. They don't really like too much acid. And I put in, since I needed that soil, you want to use the existing soil that's there, but you also want to make sure that you can get down four to six inches. Then I put down two to three inches of mushroom compost in the garden bed. And because I had a drainage problem, I went to my next favorite soil amendment, which is the sphagnum peat moss. And what's nice about sphagnum peat moss is that when you have too much water, it absorbs. And when you have not enough water, it retains. As a matter of fact, I almost forgot. I actually have samples here of both the peat moss and the mushroom compost. So the peat moss is very nice and fine, a lightish brown color. And you just, as I, as I said, put in two, if you need to use it, put in two to three inches within the garden bed. And so that's the pe uh, sphagnum peat moss. And then, as I said, my all-time favorite compost is mushroom compost. And again, it's a very dark, almost looks like loom. It's such a pretty color as far as soil color, even though it's a compost. And the other thing is that it is the debris. It is what is left over after mushroom growers grow their mushrooms. Other forms of compost that work, your own compost if you want to use that, if you have that to use. Another form of compost that works is um, your um, 
cow manure or your or your chicken manure and so a lot of people actually prefer the chicken manure it's homogenized it's been treated properly it is not taken from the chickens immediately so it's gone through a process treatment to make sure it's safe and that's the one thing please with any compost don't use any manure type compost if it hasn't been treated or homogenized pasteurized whatever word you want to choose today to to use it you don't want to get sick so that's the way to stay healthy so you can use as i said the chicken manure you can use the cow manure you can use your own compost and again you're looking at putting down two to three inches now after you've done this the next thing that's very important is garden lime and garden lime is different from the lawn lime garden lime has magnesium in it as well you don't get the magnesium in your lawn lime that's a different type of lime the main reason you want garden lime is that your vegetables such as your tomato vegetables your peppers your eggplant they all need calcium and lime is calcium as a matter of fact the other thing that i do when my garden is growing and my tomato plants are growing I save all my eggshells. I rinse them out, dry them up, then I crush them up, and I put them around my tomato plants. Plus, a little what we might call pro tip here, don't crush them up too much because slugs can't stand going over the eggshells. It hurts their little bodies. So it's another way of preventing a slug problem in your vegetable garden. Now, I've got a very interesting question from one of my participants in that seminar that I was teaching, and I had never thought of this before. But the question was, can bees go through chicken wire if you place that around your garden? And I thought, good question. Well, yes. Your bees with pollen on their legs can go through chicken wire that is as close as a quarter of an inch or as small as a quarter of an inch most of the chicken wire the one i have around my property is actually a half an inch but it's fascinating and what to me is even more and this this information comes from the bee association and what i found also interesting was that bees can go through as small as an eighth of an inch of mesh but not with pollen. If they go through that small of a mesh, the pollen falls off their legs. So you can go as small as one quarter of an inch if you want, if, but you don't have to go that small because half an inch works just as well. The um, next thing then is to take a look at your fertilizer and what type of fertilizer do you need? Because garden lime Yes, it improves the calcium, it improves the magnesium levels of your garden, but it is not a fertilizer. And some people mistake the garden lime with being a fertilizer. Instead, there's different types of fertilizers. And again, when in doubt, then I recommend that you go with a fertilizer that has all the numbers that are even, such as this one being a 10, 10, 10. Or this one is a 15, 15, 14. And that means that your nitrogen levels, your phosphorus levels, and your potash levels are almost all the same. And another way of looking at it is 10% or 10% or 10%. I mean, they're just basically one-third, one-third, one-third. So they're even. And this is really the best fertilizer. Some of the fertilizers may have names, specialty names. But the reason they do is that some of these specialty named fertilizers will add micronutrients to it. So this, brand, this particular brand has iron in it. It has calcium. It has magnesium in it. 
and uh, not in very high levels, but that actually helps with the plants. And this fertilizer, this 101010, if you read the back of the label, you'll see that this fertilizer is just simply the actual fertilizer itself. The other thing that's important as a general note when you're creating your garden is to make sure that you plant your tall plants in what I call the north side of your garden. You don't want that sun, as that sun is coming across the garden, you don't want that sun to be trapped by the tall plants like your trellis plants or tomato plants or any kind of climbing vine. You want the lower plants to be in that space and then the higher plants in a space where they're not casting a shadow. And that's very important. What I'd like to do is also, because you can sow your seeds in mid, as early as mid-March, I'd like to give you a little demonstration on the best way to sow seeds into your garden. So this is my little pr pretend garden bed. And this is my amended soil here. And then what you do is you can use a screwdriver, you can use a pencil, or you can use your finger as well. And so I'm just making a very, very small indentation here in the soil. Not deep, you don't want to plant your seeds deep. Then I take vermiculite. And the reason vermiculite is very good, and it actually helps with the seeds, is that vermiculite prevents too much moisture from getting to your seeds. And especially if you have a place such as I do where there's a drainage problem, or if we get a heavy rainfall, because we never quite know what the weather is. And yes, we can look out a month or two and down the road, but that still doesn't tell us about the weather. So what you do is you take this vermiculite and you put it in this little crevice. So now when you're looking at your area of where you're going to plant your seeds, you can see you have, it almost looks like a little riverbed there, but you can see that now you have your area for your seeds. And then you just take your seed package, and in this case, these are basil seeds. Basil seeds are very tiny. They almost look like almost like pepper seeds. I mean, they're even smaller than, than your black pepper seeds or maybe sesame seeds that you may have in your house, but they're very, very small. And so what you do is, this I always laugh, what they talk about is to plant just one seed and then two or three inches plant another seed. And I'm like, yes, when the seeds are literally one millimeter in diameter, I'll know how, how much there is. So no, I just plant what I can just with my finger here. And then I just take the soil and gently cover the soil. And the seeds just went on top of that vermiculite. I didn't really bury the seeds. I didn't put them below the vermiculite. I want that vermiculite surrounding the seeds. And then just cover it, and then just water it. As it grows, what you'll notice, and this will sprout in about, it starts sprouting in about um, 10 to 15 days. And when it first starts sprouting, you kind of leave them, and then you wait until they're about one or two inches tall, 
And at that point, they'll get their, they should start getting their, what I call their true leaves. And then you take a look and say, oh dear, all those seeds that I put in there, I now have something that looks like, like a little forest. And so what you may want to do, whether you use a tweezers to do it, whether you use your own fingers to do it, you'll want to pluck out some of those extra, in this case, basil that I've just put in here to grow, because if they're too close together, they'll be crowded and you'll have a problem as far as, um, as a good healthy growth. But I do recommend that when you plant the seeds in the garden, please always with your seeds use vermiculite if you want a better yield. The other thing that I recommend is that if you're going to plant peas or beans, those peas and beans are actually very, very large. Now, you want to treat either pea or bean seeds a little different than you do your basil or your carrots or your lettuce seeds. Those seeds are small. But as I already started mentioning, pea seeds are large. And your bean seeds are just as large as this. So what you want to do if you want the most maximum success is these, and what I have in my hand are pea seeds. These pea seeds have a very, very, very hard casing around them. And so you want to pre-germinate these. And what pre-germination means is not only do you want to give them a little boost so that they'll grow better, but you want to soften that skin. And so take a wet paper towel, place the seed or several seeds in the wet paper towel, just wrap it up, then take some form of plastic bag, and sorry, it has to be a plastic bag for this to work properly because you need to retain the moisture cloth bags won't work because they won't retain the moisture. And then put the seed in the bag and then leave the bag open. So you're putting the seed in the bag and you're leaving the bag open. And then all you do is leave this like this overnight and that pre-germinates the seed, makes it better to plant. And if you don't want to take it out of the bag, what you'll find is that it starts germinating in the bag and you can actually grow a pea plant in this plastic bag. I've spoken a lot about my cultivated garden. I actually don't have any pictures right now to show you of my potted garden or my potted herb garden, and part of the reason is that the squirrels actually got to it and decided to remove all my herbs and take them off to their little homes. But planting in pots is great. Why? You can plant on your deck. You can plant on your patio. You can actually put these potted plants in your regular flower beds and no one will know that you're growing vegetables or herbs in those flower beds, especially if you have a homeowner's association that doesn't let you. So the thing with pots is pot size matters. This is a pot that's 12 inches deep. This is the smallest size that you can get for a pot if you want to plant squash, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, you're better off actually if you're planting any of those to get a pot that is 24 inches deep. In other words, twice the size of this. The other, then with the other vegetables, this is a pot that is about 
12 inches deep. And this pot size is very good for plants like basil, or herbs, well, herbs and plants like basil, or any other kinds of herbs that you have, or bush tomatoes, or there are bush peas as well. And then finally, your six inch pot, that will work for any type of herb. The only thing I recommend is don't mix your thyme or catmint or any creeping herb with your basil. They won't like it. Having an edible garden lets you enjoy fresh vegetables and herbs and also increases your connection with nature. I hope that you enjoyed learning about edible gardens and how to create them. I'm your host, Misty Kacheris, and I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me here at Gardening with Burke Nursery. I'm looking forward to helping you grow your garden. Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188.